How would you like to grow your own fossil? It's easy. All you need is one of these and some of what I've got in this container. I'll just get some water and we can sprinkle some of these into it and we can come back later and see what kind of fossil they've grown into. And what do you get when you plant this nut? Come with me into the forest and I'll show you. Well, this is what you get. A cycad with its dark green leaves and its crop of poisonous seeds, such as this one that we showed you before. The Aborigines used to eat it by slicing it, drying it and fermenting it for several weeks. Not exactly what you'd call fast food, but the cycad today is exactly the same as it was when the last dinosaur walked past. The same is true of another attractive little plant commonly known as a tassel fern. It really isn't a fern at all. It belongs in the lycopod family. You find them growing along the wet edges of streams in swamps or rainforest trees like this one. And like the cycad, a tassel fern would have been readily recognised by the biggest blundering brontosaurus. In fact, this plant is surprisingly similar to what many people commonly regard as one of the oldest land plant fossils in Australia. This fossil goes under the rather profound title of Barognathia longifolia, which we've since discovered is a fancy name for a dead tassel fern. It seems tassel ferns haven't changed either. This fossil, by the way, was found in the Silurian rocks of Victoria. And don't be put off by the term Silurian, it was simply a word invented by Scotsman Sir Roderick Murchison uh, in honour of an extinct warlike tribe of Britons who lived along the borderland of Wales where these rocks were first studied. Since then, any rocks around the world that have got fossils similar to that area have been given the name Silurian. Fossils such as this fish from the shales of Wyoming or this fern from the coal seams of Nova Scotia are the buried remains of plants and animals that have been preserved in the rocks. They give us a good idea of what life in the past was really like. If you today were taken and thrown into the acidy waters of a peat bog and your body preserved by the chemicals in the bog, you too could acquire fame as a fossil, if anybody found you, that is. Most people think of fossils as dead things, but the surprising thing is that the world is full of fossils which are well and truly still alive. Your gardens and carpets are full of them. Springtails and silverfish is what I mean. They're both living fossils. In fact, the term living fossil has come to mean any animal or plant whose fossil ancestor is just as easy to recognize in the rocks as the living creature today. They haven't changed since they first appeared on the face of this planet. Textbooks usually proclaim that life has been changing or evolving and fossils provide some of the best evidence for this. Yet knowledge of the large number of living fossils has been a closely guarded professional secret with few exceptions such as this. A coelacanth fish caught off the coast of Africa just before Christmas Day in 1938 after having been claimed in the textbooks as extinct since the time of the dinosaurs. Many scientists hoped to have at last had their hands on an example of an animal evolving from a fish to a frog-like creature. But the coelacanth has been so successful at being a coelacanth, it has not been evolving into anything else. In the time it was supposed to be extinct, in fact in all the time since it first appeared in Devonian rocks, it has faithfully produced replicas of coelacanths. It was and is a living fossil. Devonian rocks form some of the most spectacular scenery on the face of this earth. Places such as Table Mountain in South Africa, or the Catskills in North America, or the Rhineland area of Eastern Europe are all Devonian. They have fossils in them which are similar to the area of Devon in the United Kingdom, where these rocks were first studied. And for those of you who are fishermen, you find it interesting to know that Devonian rocks are full of fish. Apart from that rare and publicized example of a living fossil such as Ixelacanth, the existence of vast numbers of such creatures has been one of the best kept professional secrets amongst the world of those who know about fossils. It's been hidden in technical terms, disguised in scientific jargonese. If I was to tell you that Heterodontus japonicus and Rhizocrinus lofotensis were undergoing a period of stasis in their evolution, the only impression I'd leave most of you with is that things are evolving. But what I really said was that the common old Port Jackson shark, which lives in the waters alongside the rather famous opera house in Sydney, Australia, shows no evidence of evolving and never has. Neither does the sea lily. 
they are both as stable and unchanging as they've always been. What you're about to see on this program is a world full of creatures whose fossil ancestors are as easy to recognize today as they ever have been. We still have their living descendants with us. Actually, I have some dinosaur food for lunch today. This is what I mean, grapes. As easy for us to recognize as they would have been for triceratops, pterodactyls or brachiosaurs because we have grape leaf fossils in the same rocks as dinosaurs. And grapes are still with us. They show no signs of ever having evolved. Grapes, tassel ferns, cycads and coelacanths are living fossils. So I dare you to think as we look at the little known kingdom of living fossils, it will shatter your views on the evolution of life on this planet. And this tree hasn't evolved either. And the birds love to flock into the huge branches of this tree, which is native to Moreton Bay on the east coast of Australia. And what are they after? Well, the ground is covered with them. These things, figs, wild figs. For this is one of the many varieties of figs which is found throughout the world that man has put to use from laxatives to cookies and desserts. Most people are familiar with the common Turkish fig. So you don't need much in-depth study to recognize this next fossil. That's right, they're fig fossils. And figs have remained the same since they first appeared on this planet. They haven't produced anything except different varieties of figs. Fig fossils are found in what are commonly called Cretaceous rocks. That word is simply a Latin-based term. It was invented in 1822, and it simply means chalky. The reason being that this type of rock was first studied in areas such as the famous white and rather chalky cliffs of Dover. So if you're into fossil food, try a fig. In the middle of the 19th century, a man called Charles Darwin wrote a book about life and fossils. Most people view Darwin as the man who proposed that life had evolved upwards. Worms became fishes. Fish-like creatures grew legs and turned into frogs. And ape-like beings somehow evolved into men. All life had a common ancestor and could be linked bit by bit back to the start. According to Darwin and most evolutionists since then, the evolutionary process has taken vast periods of time and produced a world where change is the only certainty. The modern world has virtually forgotten that before Darwin, Western man was sure that the world and all that was in it had been created by God. Even the geologists who named the basic divisions of the geological column, such as Cretaceous and Devonian, were firmly committed to creation. Their geologic studies had uncovered no fossils that challenged this belief. Although Darwin was not a geologist, he was well aware of fossils. But his belief that life had evolved from a common ancestor meant that he needed to show that fossils linked all creatures together. He wrote about these links in his book, The Origin of the Species. Here's what he said. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Darwin went on to hypothesize that the reason the evidence for his theory was missing was perhaps that the rock record was not good enough to preserve it. Well, we've had more than 130 years now since Darwin, and the fossils still do not show that life forms have slowly changed from one type to another, and they certainly don't link all life forms back to a common start. The surprising thing is that the fact that fossils do not provide support for Darwin's evolutionary theory has been known since Darwin wrote the book. Yet for the past century, school and college textbooks have been full of statements that fossils are perhaps the best proof that Darwin was correct. The paradox is that the popularity of evolution has increased at the same time as the professionals have confirmed the complete absence of fossil proof for it. And what have they found? Evidence such as this. Any idea what it is? It's really the wing of a monster, but a rather common monster as you'll discover shortly. The great-great-grandfathers of the rather fragile, delicate and beautiful little dragonflies that hover over the waterways of today's world are little different to their living descendants. It doesn't matter how old you think the rocks are you find fossil dragonflies in, you have little difficulty recognizing them. This fossil dragonfly, dug from Jurassic rocks of Bavaria, shows that dragonflies have produced copies of themselves over and over again. 
Jurassic rocks are named after the Jura Mountains that forms a border between France and Switzerland. Today, if you're studying rocks in the USA or Australia or anywhere which has fossils similar to the Jura Mountains, they're given the same name, Jurassic. Dragonflies have made copy after copy stamped out of the same mould. The amount of stability involved in dragonfly reproduction through time is phenomenal. Dragonflies, like all other living fossils, have not evolved at all. And what was our monster? You may have guessed it by now, but the wing you were looking at before belonged to a long dead dragonfly. It had a wingspan of at least 14 inches or 35 centimetres. And it was by no means among the biggest of the great great grand uncles of the dragonfly. The record belongs to a creature with the label Meganeura. Found in the carbon rich shales of North America, it had a wingspan about two thirds of a metre, between two and three feet. But don't worry, we found no fossil mosquitoes anywhere near that big. Dragonflies like the cycad, the grape, the silverfish, the springtail and the tassel fern belong to that fascinating class of living fossils. They show no hint of having evolved from their basic form into anything else. And dragonflies were not alone in having giant ancestors. This fragment of a fossil tassel fern called a lepidodendron or giant club moss came from a plant known to have reached 114 feet or around about 35 meters in height. Huge tassel ferns such as this one have been found in the coal-bearing rocks of the United Kingdom. This fossil horsetail rush grew as high as a 10-storey building, yet today's horsetails only reach about 3 feet or 1 metre high in the wetter areas of the Northern Hemisphere. And this beautifully polished section of a fossil tree fern found in the Jurassic rocks of Queensland, Australia, belong to a world of fern trees that makes today's 5 metre high tree fern look like a dwarf. The world is full of living fossil plants, such as maples, walnuts, magnolias, willows, birch, sassafras and this rare king fern. On the edge of extinction and surviving only in a few rainforest retreats on Australia's east coast. And we can add to this list the popular fan palm, metasequoia and the odd monkey puzzle tree, as well as this, the wild coral fern from down under. Mind boggling? Then think about the ancestors of cockroaches, unchanged since they were first buried in the Carboniferous rocks. Its ancestors have successfully manufactured more than 800 variations of their own kind throughout history. The word Carboniferous was first invented to describe the carbon-rich shales around some British coal mines. The good news? Cockroaches are not evolving into anything worse. The bad news? Neither are they becoming extinct. Cockroaches are only one amongst many of the world's insects that are living fossils. And how many is that? One statistic you may find useful, of some 12,000 kinds of fossil insects discovered so far from butterflies to houseflies, beetles and bugs of all descriptions, the majority are similar to living insects. Your house and garden are full of many living fossils that have not evolved despite the fact you've been told they did. They're not even evolving resistance to poisons. All we've achieved by spraying them is to kill off the ones that don't have resistance leaving those that were already resistant to our poison spray before we invented it. Exactly the opposite of what you'd expect if evolution were true. But this amazing array of living fossils is not confined to creatures which live on the dry land. Here on this rather muddy bottom of what can at high tide and on a sunny day be an otherwise beautiful Moreton Bay on the east coast of Australia lives an interesting little creature. Here's the shell of one which has been thrown out on the mud it's a member of the lampshell family or brachiopods, commonly known as lingula, or uh, the thumbnail shell because it so closely resembles the end of your thumbnail. The lingulas today live throughout the Pacific Ocean Islands. The different varieties of lingula throughout the world are either longer or shorter or fatter or thinner, but in essence, they're lingula. Same today as they've always been. Lingula is readily recognizable as a fossil in this rock. I'll just put the two side by side and you'll soon see that. And it doesn't take much skill to identify the fossils in this Carboniferous rock which I brought back from Scotland. That's right, they're lingular. Carboniferous rocks are often black because they're rich in carbon. Remember they were first investigated around the coal mines in the United Kingdom. And this amazing little lingular in this Carboniferous rock and in all other rocks hasn't evolved at all. It's the same as its descendant here in Moreton Bay, 
on the east coast of Australia. So just how many more creatures are in this category of living fossil? For good measure, let's add these shells which may live in the sea somewhere near you. Terry Bracciolina, a living fossil lamp shell, identical to the one that giant Brachiosaurus would have recognised and still totally unevolved. And this, a very pointed Tarotella, alongside its fossil ancestor, as well as the common old Arca shell. It's a living fossil also. And so is one that every connoisseur will recognise on his plate or attached to the rocks, the well-known oyster. And cast your eyes over this beautiful array of pectin or scallop shells, which most car drivers can recognise as the shell on the petrol or gas pump. Little different from the fossil pectin of Cretaceous, Carboniferous or any other rocks. Pectins, Terebratulinas, Lingulas, Taratellas and Oysters are as unevolved as you could get. They haven't altered their basic format since their first day in the sea. And not only that, they show not the slightest hint of having developed from any other type of seashell either. And these are only a few of many hundreds of examples of living fossils that still survive on present day seashores and seafloors. This machine-like ability to produce copies of themselves makes them a hallmark of stability and a classic example of non-change. It means they are duplicators which resist evolving at every turn. But technically, they have lived lives of totally unpunctuated equilibrium since their first moment of existence, which should make you rethink everything you've been taught about the history of life on the planet you live on. And we've just begun to take the lid off the Pandora's box concerning evolution. What makes these creatures so good at being themselves? And how and why do they resist change so successfully? Come and we'll find out. What is true of sea creatures is also true for freshwater lobsters and crayfish. Throw a dozen on the barbie sometime. They taste good and they won't harm the ozone layer. But what most people don't know and what they're not told in the textbooks is that this common old lobster and its saltwater cousins are as easy to recognise today as they always have been. Lobsters or crayfish and their relatives have always been just that, lobsters or crayfish. It shows in these Australian fossils. Whether they've got big clippers or small clippers, long tails or short tails, or like their cousin buried in the Jurassic rocks of Europe, you can tell what they are. Their basic plan is essentially the same today as it was when they were first buried in the rocks. And how long ago was that? Since before the days when Charles Darwin first hypothesised that life was continually evolving, the supposed age of the Earth has doubled and quadrupled in the textbooks from a mere 6,000 years old in the 1700s to 2 billion by World War II, up to nearly 5 billion at present. But the older you believe the rocks to be, the bigger problems your ideas on evolution encounter from creatures such as this lobster. If over such vast periods of time, this is all lobsters and their kin have evolved, then they're never going to get round to it. Neither are these creatures which live alongside them in the fresh water. A mussel, same today as the one you can see here in the rocks. And like all our other living fossils, they show no sign of having evolved from any other life form either. And now's a good time to see what our living fossils that we sprinkled into the water earlier have grown into. Well, there's some movement there. We'll come back later when they've fully grown. If you're on the west coast of the USA at the right time of the year, you might find so many of these that you wouldn't have any beach left to stand on. You'd also find plenty of people shoveling them into the back of their utilities. What are they? And why are they being shoveled into the backs of cars? It's a horseshoe crab, of course. These days, one is supposed to call it Kaisafura. Occasionally in science magazines, you'll come across articles on our friend the horseshoe crab. The title of an old article in a popular geographic gives it away. It's called the changeless horseshoe crab. The storyline is simply that the horseshoe crab hasn't changed one bit. It's simply not in the business of evolving. And the evidence is indisputable. It's rock solid, in fact. Even the first horseshoe crabs and their tracks, which you find in the Cambrian rocks of Nova Scotia, had the same basic characteristics as horseshoe crabs on the beaches of today. Here's one from the Jurassic rocks of Germany. Look at the horseshoe shape and that spiny tail down the back. Here's a living one again, recently collected from the beach. No evolution at all. The first horseshoe crabs had the same fundamental design as today's armour-plated survivors. Still puzzling as to what the horseshoe crab could be used for? 
Well, the Indians of North America use the spine for tips of their spears. And the farmers sometimes collect so many of these things that they simply crush them up and use them for fertiliser in their paddocks. And the eggs they use for pig food. And because the horseshoe crab is not in the business of evolving, they've got a guaranteed source of pig food for quite a while yet. But the horseshoe crab is not an isolated example of creatures which have stayed the same. This is a fossil jellyfish, collected from just below some Cambrian rock layers. Cambria, by the way, was the Roman name for whales. Fossils common to Cambrian rocks were first studied there. But the point is obvious. Once you've seen a jellyfish floating in the seas today, it doesn't matter what age you want to place on the rocks from South Australia we found these fossils in, you can recognise the dead ancestor of a jellyfish pressed into the rock. Jellyfish, living or fossil, provide no support for Charles Darwin's or anybody else's views on evolution. And how does a jellyfish become a fossil? They've got no hard parts. When they are thrown out onto the beach by waves, they melt in the sun by the end of the day. So they had to be preserved quickly to form a fossil. It had to happen rapidly or it couldn't happen at all. And if the fossils formed rapidly, then so did the rocks they are in. Rocks themselves do not show they took long periods of time to form. Other examples found at the beach which have retained essentially the same structure include sponges, saltwater mussels and seaweed. In fact, there is one Cambrian rock, the black colm of Sweden, a type of coal, which is almost exclusively a kind of fossil seaweed. Which raises one interesting problem. Throughout the Western world for the past century, we have been told that the history of life has been one of change. Simple things have become more complex. Ape-like creatures have somehow evolved into man. Teachers and textbooks have taught it. Museums have displayed it. And fossils have so often been presented as the best evidence for it. Yet the living fossils you have seen, from the humble jellyfish to the weird-looking horseshoe crab, through the trees and insects in your garden, should tell you something is wrong. Let's test your skill. Can you recognise these fossils? What you've seen so far is the tip of an iceberg full of animals and plants whose life history has been one of stability, not evolution. The evolution of life taught to you in school textbooks has not been the real history of this earth. And if evolution has not been the real record of history, what has? Sharks show it. They are living fossils too. They have only ever reproduced sharks. The evidence is in the rocks, in the fossil sharks we dig up. Occasionally, whole sharks have been so rapidly buried, they've been stamped into the mud as fossils. But that's rare compared to finding sharks' teeth, their only hard part. And living fossil sharks still have the same sharp teeth they always had. See these? You sometimes find them in jewellery shops on the end of pendants. They are fossilised sharks' teeth. Easy to recognise. How big a shark do you think this fossil tooth came from? In Devonian and other rocks, there are often so many teeth fossilised, they can even clog up drilling wells. The number of sharks buried in the rocks must be in the billions, but not one so far has shown any evidence that it has or could evolve. The same is true of their cousins, the rays. See how similar this ray is to the fossil found in the Jurassic rocks of Germany? Any fisherman could tell the fossil is merely a dead ray. It doesn't even matter how old you think the rocks from Germany are, rays have always been rays. And how big was the mouth of the shark? At least seven feet or two metres across. It's been labelled Carcharodon megalodon and it grew to at least 45 feet or 15 metres, a cousin of today's great white shark. Where does this leave evolution? Because the same is true for so much sea life, including the sturgeon, the gar, the bowfin fish, the mackerel, the perch and the common old herring. All are living fossils unchanged from their first appearance in the ocean and none showing even the slightest hint they've evolved from any other creature. Anyone who has studied biology has heard of a man called Linnaeus. Actually, that's his Latinized name. His real name was Carl von Linn, a brilliant Swede who gave mankind the first scientific system for labeling plants and animals that worked. This leaf, for instance, 
comes from a plant which has been labelled ginkgo biloba. The name has two words in it, ginkgo its genus name and biloba the species name. This double naming system which Linnaeus invented has proved an excellent way of making sure that everyone is talking about the same plant or animal, living or fossil, or like the ginkgo, a living fossil. Here's its fossil cousin, Ginkgo simonsi. But Linnaeus's system was firmly based on his belief plants and animals do not evolve into different kinds. Why did Linnaeus believe this? Like all scientists of the time, Linnaeus was firmly convinced that life had been specially created. In fact, that's where he got his concept of species from. Life was specially or specially made. Linnaeus, a Lutheran Christian, was so sure that God had made creatures to produce their own kinds that he put his faith to work on the facts and invented a labelling system that has served science well. Even now, in the 20th century, the rocks and fossils are still providing remarkable confirmation that Linnaeus's ideas were anything but specious. Evolutionists still use Linnaeus's system when they classify fossils, and it works. Why does a system based on creation work so well when it's used on fossils which supposedly show evolution? Simply because the gaps in the fossil record, which even Darwin knew about, make it impossible to link all life together in a continuous evolutionary chain. Those same gaps make it possible to label the fossils in separate groups. The gaps are not random. They're very systematic, in fact. Something they should not be if all life evolved in a random process over vast periods of time. This recent nautilus was found on the beach in northern Australia. And this fossil nautilus comes from the rocks of central Queensland in Australia. They make one point. You can believe in evolution all you like, but nautilus shells are not doing it. If this is all that Nautilus has evolved, then the hereditary code that controls Nautilus and all other living fossils is incredibly stable. It resists change so well that time, chance and circumstance have not enabled Nautilus or any other living fossil to evolve at all. In the first science fiction book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Jules Verne named his then imaginary submarine Nautilus. But we can't give Verne the credit for inventing the submarine. Look at this nautilus. An octopus type creature lives in here and when it wants to rise to the surface it pumps air into the top. When it wants to sink it pumps air out. You're quite right, that's how a submarine works but man didn't think of it first. And just as you couldn't survive if you went to sea in a half finished submarine, neither could a half finished nautilus. Built into this shell is all the evidence that the first nautilus appeared as a finished functional model. Its Silurian ancestor was so well suited to doing the Nautilus thing, it has remained the same ever since. Nautilus has never evolved from anything else. It has been and is a fantastic self-replicator. Man has used intelligence to create an artificial Nautilus, and we have called it a submarine. But mankind's submarine worked only when we perfected the machinery. Submarines did not get here by chance. Chaos and accident did not produce them. Neither did they appear by themselves, simply because the potential to make submarines was already there. They exist only because an intelligent being, namely man, who existed before the submarine, was not a part of it, and who was and is smarter than any submarine, actually decided to build one. It's this inbuilt perfection of functional design from the start of Nautilus existence which forces us to rethink everything we've been taught about evolution. It's no good suggesting such creatures have reached a peak of perfection in their evolution. It's been tried by the experts and it just doesn't work. And all the examples we've listed show no hint of ever having been anything else. They've been functionally perfect right from the start of their existence. How do they do it? The answer is built into man. You inherited your life characteristics from your mother and father through little things called genes. The information on those genes determined whether you have red hair, black hair, or no hair at all. You are also made of parts which make themselves over and over. Your skin is an excellent example. It is constantly making new cells to replace older cells which wear out. But what most people don't realize is that even the simplest self-replicating cell in your body is more complex than any machine man has ever made, yet alone envisaged. Mathematicians have talked for a long time about how to make a machine which can make a copy of itself which would then manufacture a new copy and so on. The complex theory has been tossed around for a long time, but no human mind has ever yet invented a working machine which does this. 
Even those four basic ingredients of evolution, matter, energy, time and chance, have not enabled man to produce a self-replicating machine. Yet life is one. You are one. Your body shows all the brilliant and predictable mathematical evidence of the designs man has been trying unsuccessfully to make. The natural submarine, the Nautilus, can make copies of itself. Our artificial submarine cannot. The designs put into such self-replicating machinery have been put in place by an intelligence greater than yours or mine. Yet Scottish philosopher David Hume said no. Such an argument is valid only for machines like watches. If you find a watch, there must be a watchmaker. But Hume claimed you can't argue this way for animals and plants, because they are not machines like watches. They are purely natural phenomena. Well, this century has shown Hume was wrong. Not only does the smallest cell in the simplest animal or plant contain far more complex machinery than any man has invented, unlike the watch, which is a dead machine, the living machines, the plants and animals which inhabit this world, can make copies of themselves and have done so very successfully. Fossils prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And like the watch, the existence of such complex living machinery tells us there is a machine maker far smarter than any living machine on the face of this planet. So where have the promoters of evolution gone wrong? Let me show you where they have made their biggest mistake. They've exaggerated a creature's ability to produce green or red, tall or short varieties of itself into a belief that chemicals could turn into living cells and seaweed could evolve into gum trees. This plant is part of a much bigger family. Once you've seen one, you can easily recognize all the cousins of a pineapple. Beautiful plants like these bromeliads. Found with one exception, originally in South America, there are approximately 2,000 varieties. Easy to recognize because of the cup-like arrangement of leaves in many of them. They are placed in one family more importantly because their leaves are covered with microscopic scales. The more scales, the more silver or grey the leaves. The fewer scales, the more green shows through. These scales are magnificent water traps which filter water out of the air, so bromeliads can live in some very harsh environments, from deserts to dry mountain tops, even though they prefer rainforests. They range from miniatures to ones with large cups and back again to the common old grandfather's beard or Spanish moss. Yes, it's a bromeliad, upside down and stretched out a little. This one's a cross between a pineapple and one of the coloured bromeliads, a sure sign they are in the same family. And it was Linnaeus who gave official approval to the name in his book on plant species. We do have a fossil bromeliad. It's known as Caratophyllum bromelioides. Why? because it looks like a dead bromeliad. And Caratus was what the West Indian natives called the things when Columbus first arrived. Bromeliads and all the other creatures you have seen have faithfully produced replicas of themselves since before Moses the Israelite handed down the first five books of the Bible. It was a statement in the first of those books that gave scientists such as Linnaeus the key to developing the science of classification. For the past 4,000 years or so, mankind has been trying to change various animals and plants for human benefit. We've used crossbreeding, tricks of lighting, food and climatic changes to try and produce new plants and animals for our own use, plus sophisticated mutation producing chemicals and radiation on creatures such as bacteria and fruit fly to try and force them to evolve. But all we've ended up with is mangled bacteria and battered fruit flies. The point is that 4,000 years of observation by intelligent man trying to change animals and plants are worth far more than 4 billion years of imagined evolutionary change not based on any known case of an animal or plant altering into some other kind. Even our patented pigs produced through genetic engineering prove that you can only bring about the kinds of animals and plants you want by playing creator. The living fossil brine shrimp we've been growing in our test tube show, like all shrimp, no evolutionary change since shrimp were first fossilized. Neither do the finches which Darwin saw when he went to the Galapagos Islands. He suggested these finches had probably descended from finches that originated in South America. But it was and still is pure imagination to state that if finches from South America could produce some 14 different varieties of finches on the Galapagos Islands, then reptiles grew wings and turned into birds, and ape-like creatures could evolve a brain and a voice box and stand around discussing the evolution of man. Finches are fact. 
the evolution of man is exaggeration. Here's something you've seen before, a member of the frog family. And remember this, it's the fossil frog from Germany you saw a while back. And we have other recognisable portions of frogs from deep within the earth also. It doesn't matter what age you think the fossil frogs are, all known frog remains show us that frogs have never evolved from anything else. And they've not developed into anything except frogs. And what a huge variety has been produced from a basic theme. Frogs such as these. Frogs which live in jungles and waterways. Frogs you can use for poison arrows. Bright-eyed ones. Common green frogs. From weirdly striped thumb-sized corroboree frogs that live in Australia's snowy mountains. Up to this giant frog which weighs in at 7 kilograms and has a hop of some 4 metres, a goliath frog from the Cameroon swamps of Africa. Frogs like bromeliads and a host of other creatures, from cycad and tassel fern, to shells like lingula and oyster. Marine creatures such as the shark, through to figs and cockroaches, have only ever produced variations of their own kind. Time and chance have not been able to alter that. You and I are no exception. All the supposed evidence that man has evolved from some ape-like ancestor could be fitted into a single coffin with plenty of room to spare. Every recorded observation of man living in fossil tell us that people always produce people. Lighter ones or darker ones, those with heavy protruding eye ridges or those without, but always and only people. Man has never evolved from any other creature. Human DNA has such stability it ensures that this living copy maker only ever produces human copies. Every person on the face of this planet shows the inbuilt characteristics of brilliantly designed self-replicating machinery that has only one possible origin. Man began his existence on this earth as a fully functional, completely finished being. But you and I are more than mere machinery. That inner creativity which drives us to reshape our environment, send rockets to the moon, play music on everything from a gum leaf to a computer, as well as create weird and wonderful worlds of our own in science fiction, sets us apart from all other creatures. It also shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that man's creativity is a reflection of the creativeness of the one who made man in the first place. Man alone was made in the image of God.